Welcome to Prophecy Insights. Welcome to Prophecy Insights by Bro Steph, or with Bro Steph, that's me. And I'm doing this live uh, with a different mechanism. I'm uh, actually using a laptop computer to stream the live feed, and it will be interesting to see how this uh, turns out, and it will be a new experience for both you and me. But I wanted to talk about today two things. One, what in the world is going on? And I've got, I've got some notes that I've written here that I want to share with you on some recent information that's going on globally and how that ties into biblical prophecy. Also, there is, I want you to stay tuned to the end of this because I'm going to share with you something amazing that is taking place in Israel. And um, it, and what Jesus talked about in uh, John 4, uh, it links perfectly into John 4. So I want to share that with you, but that's going to come at the end. This shouldn't be real long, uh, but let's get started. So what in the world is going on? What does it mean? What do the events of today mean to us today? And what does the Bible have to say about them? Well, let's just go down my, my uh, list. Number one, the – got to read my writing. So the two most influential global economies, the USA and Great Britain, are experiencing – um lots of political turmoil right now the uh brexit issue um is on the ropes you know the people of britain want to pull away from the eu the politicians want to stay connected and in a way it's kind of like a a what we call the soft coup where the people have voted for one thing, but the politicians are not following the will of the people and trying to do another. We would call that a soft coup today. I mean, um, the exiting from Brexit was supposed to happen a while back, and now Boris Johnson, the new prime minister, promised that he would follow the will of the people by October well, the parliament shut him down and they recessed the entire parliament for weeks to try to force Boris Johnson out of office. That's one thing. Keep that in mind now. Put it on the shelf. And now let's look at what's going on with President Trump. Um, I call it Pelosi versus Trump. And uh, the formal. Uh, impeachment uh, inquiry that that the Democratic uh, leaders in the House are calling for. It's a soft coup. That's all there is to it. When you look at the evidences, and you can go online and look at this, uh, the copy of the notes from the meeting President Trump had with the Ukrainian president. You can read the notes, it's only three pages. Um, he committed no crime. And the president of the United States is tasked by the Constitution to protect the American people and to defend America. That's part of what he does. So there's nothing wrong with the president asking a leader in another country, do you, you know, do you have this corruption going on in your country? I want to know because 
it could affect our relationship moving forward. Because the president of the U.S. has to protect, above everything, the citizens of the United States of America. That's his job. And every president that's ever been president has had these kinds of discussion. So a soft coup is going on in the United States. A soft coup is going on in Great Britain. And I want to bring that to your attention. Number two, there's a financial crash that is looming. Now, many financial experts do not know if it's going to be an inflationary cycle or a depression. Now, the feelings are mixed, but they, they know something is coming. They just don't know what it is yet. Uh, look, some of the countries, uh, wealthiest countries, some of them are offering negative return bonds. Let me explain to you what that means. Let's say I have a bond and I tell you you're going to get, you know, X amount of percent when you put your money into this utility bond or whatever it may be. And there's a caveat to it, however, because our government isn't making money and we're in an inflationary cycle and inflation is running out of control, at the end of your 10-year term, you're not going to make any money. But thank you for the money you invested with us. That's what's going on in the world today. Governments are offering negative yielding bonds that will not earn anyone a penny. The EU is using quantitative easing to bail out their economy to the tune of, are you ready? Now sit down and put on your seatbelt. To the tune of $20 billion a month. Great Britain's printing money, 20 billion bucks a month to keep their economy, hopefully, from faltering. Now, that's Great Britain. You know, we did that back in 2008. The reason, excuse me, coffee break. <sighs> Got to have coffee when you do these. Look, we did it in 2008, right? Um. We bailed out the banks. We bailed out some really big organizations. We bailed, bailed out Chrysler, right, and printed money like crazy. It was called quantitative easing. Quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, and I think they went all the way up to four. Well, sooner or later, the chickens come home to roost, and you have to pay for monies that you created that have no gold or silver or no equity behind them. It's just paper. Sooner or later, a government goes into an inflationary cycle. And these debts, when you print money, you're creating debt. It has to be paid for, and it's got to be paid back. That's going on all over the globe today. And I'm leading up to something with all this. Okay, so here's, here's another one. Um, looking at my notes. The U.S. banks need an infusion of cash from the feds. Now, I hope you kept your seatbelts on. You're not going to believe this figure. $160 billion every 24 hours, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to meet obligations, operating expenses, uh, and as well as banks being able to meet their cash reserve cash reserves that legally they have to meet. The banks 
need from the feds, $160 billion every 24 hours so that they'll be able to stay afloat. That's what's going on in our economy right now. Now, just connect the dots. If we printed money like crazy from 2008 up to, well, maybe a year ago, that can create an inflationary cycle. And you have seen interest rates creep up a little bit. I know that because I have a HELOC on my home, which is like a second, and it's a variable second. And it's gone up in interest little bits at a time. Well, you start pumping out $160 billion every 24 hours so that the banks will be able to meet their obligation. Sooner or later, that's going to collapse your economy. You can't keep doing this indefinitely. Number four, Saudi Arabia is on the ropes due to its oil field being attacked. Um, they are a net supplier of fuel, gas, oil for the whole globe. Saudi Arabia does this for the whole globe. Well, their main oil field was hit by Iran, and it uh, took out 50% of their production. That's going to affect the world economy, number five. Um, global banks represent $110 trillion in total cash and investment value. All of the EU signed the UN initiative, environmentally responsible uh, carbon neutral policy. The environmentally responsible carbon neutral uh, mutual policy. Now, that means that globally, other countries are going to be forced by virtue of pressure by the EU, one of the largest economic blocks in the world, being part of this, uh, this uh, program, this initiative. Other countries are going to have to become part of it. Look what will happen if you're not part of the environmentally responsible carbon neutral policy. Um, Lending, investment, banking, and other services to companies that do not meet the requirements of the initiative of the new Green Deal will not get will not get lending, investment, banking, and other services provided. So people in order for countries to get the kind of services they need for their populations to exist, they're going to have to be part of this deal. That's what Europe has done. They've, they've really put other countries in a real bind. And everyone is now, I don't know really if the United States is going to have to fall in line with this because we are very self-sufficient. But a lot of the countries around the globe are going to have to do this. And we all know this is a hoax, but it's a way of controlling what doesn't belong to you. That's what's going on here. Um, you have to be at zero emission standards. And... Um, it could mean a loss of $12 trillion to the USA because we won't be able to transact big business with some country because I don't think we're going to be a part of it. That's number five. Number six, Google announced 
that it is beginning research and development of quant of the quantum computer system quantum computing uh which will accelerate the ai technology quantum computing is like well google did a test and and i don't have the numbers exact so forgive me if i'm a little off here but google did a test where they asked their quantum computer algorithm to figure out a problem what would have taken a normal smart computer uh a couple days to figure out the quantum computer and the algorithms that google has developed did it in six minutes six minutes a problem that would take a smart computer a couple days to figure out the quantum computer did it in six minutes and google wants to marry this compute computer algorithm into artificial intelligence and that's a little scary that would mean that the technology is definitely in place that when the antichrist comes to power within seconds he'll be able to locate anyone in the world within seconds he'll be able to shut uh, a company down shut off its resources etc in fact they'll be able to set up certain variables that if certain criteria isn't met then the water for a particular country could be shut off imagine that but that's where this is headed that's how powerful it is and in the hands of the wrong person it could mean disaster to some country to some people groups seven and i'll be done here in a minute student loans okay the default rates have soared to 10 percent of all federal loans outstanding loans in the United States of America. 10% student loans. That means students aren't paying back their loans. And someone isn't getting the interest and principal payments they need in order to continue to make the loans. It's not good. It all has a negative effect, effect on the economy. Chaos is becoming the new norm surprise no not if you watch prophecy insights with me you're not surprised by any of this it's just new information for you israel is surrounded by her enemies iran russia and turkey and it's their partners are contemplating uh, when to attack Israel. So we're seeing now the, the clear formation and setup of the Ezekiel 38 war. If you don't know what the Ezekiel 38 war is, just read Ezekiel 38. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, God made it precisely clear um, for us. So make sure you read that. Basically, what the Ezekiel 30 war says in summary is that Iran, Russia, Turkey, will, and North Africa will form a coalition. And the thought will come into their mind to invade Israel. God will put a hook in their jaw and pull them reluctantly into Israel to go to battle with Israel. And then God will destroy those invading armies on the mountains of Israel. They'll never make it into Israel proper. This is going to be a battle that when God fights it for Israel and defeats the enemies, the whole world's going to pay attention. And they're, they're going to, in a way, be forced to say that the God of Israel protected the Jews. So that's what this is. And then finally, I believe, let's see 
Yeah. And then finally, um, the chaos is creating a cry for solutions at any cost. People are crying out for a savior, for someone with the answer, for someone who can per just get rid of the problems and the chaos at any cost. We're being set up. This world is being completely set up. Whether you want to admit it or not, it's being set up for the Antichrist and for his invasion of planet Earth. When he comes into power, sets up his kingdom, his throne, and starts controlling the whole world. That's what's going on. And the, read Daniel chapter 11. Read Revelation 6 through 19. It will give you this whole bird's eye view of the topography of the end time situations that are going to unfold. Look, the Bible said in the book of Daniel, just read chapters 7 through 12, Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. Read Jeremiah chapter 30 and 31. Read again Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And if you read those chapters, uh, and of course Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39 ties into Revelation chapter 19, by the way. The language is almost parallel, exactly the same. Uh, so when you read Ezekiel 39, flip over to Revelation 19. Read them both together on a parallel Bible, and it'll blow your mind how close they are in their message. But if you read these scriptures, you will have a thousand percent better understanding of where we're headed and what's happening than probably anybody else, because most Christians are not paying attention to this stuff. Now, some say, well, bro, Steph, you know, uh, why are we spending so much time on things that haven't happened yet? What did Jesus tell us? If you knew when the, the robber, the thief, was going to come into the house, then you'd be prepared, right? If you knew the exact time, you'd catch him and put him in jail, get rid of him. But the Lord said, you don't know when these things are going to happen. So watch. He said, watch therefore. Pay attention. Stay alert. Not that we, you know, we, that, you know, 90% of our time we're, we're looking at politics. And I don't want you to do that. I don't think God wants us doing that either. But, you know, we should be informed listening to programs like mine listening to programs like John Howler and uh, uh, J.D., uh, Pastor J.D. out of Hawaii. You know, these men will give you the truth. And uh, you'll get a good understanding of what's going on around you. Why is it important? Why? So that we can pray with urgency. So that we can ask God to save people. Uh, again, with a sense of urgency attached to it. Now, I want to talk to you about something, as I promised at the end of the video. Something going on in Israel that just blew me away. Okay, you ready for this? All right. The, the dates, okay, dates that 2,000 years ago were native to Israel. They're uh, the Israeli palm, date tree, went extinct, and it's been extinct for just under 2,000 years. Recently, what's happened over the last few years is 
someone went up to Masada in 70 AD where, where the last stand was with the Roman Empire, the last battle the Jews had with the Roman Empire. They lived up there in, in Masada for a long time. And they had taken date seats, set them aside, and recently, about I think four years ago, they found a jar up in Masada that had these date seats in it. They carbon dated the date seats back to Jesus's day, over about two thousand years old, and so. An agriculturist, a specialist in this field, took the dead date seeds, right? And I think there were like 10 of them, planted them. One sprouted. One of the date seeds actually sprouted. So they took the seed, planted it, and now we have an original. Israeli date palm that bears the original dates that were in Israel in Jesus' day. But here's the big news to me, okay? This is what just flashed in my mind, and I knew I had to share it with you. In order for a seed to grow, what has to happen? The seed has to die. You can't get germination out of a seed unless it's dead. And then you put it into the earth and you sprinkle a little water on it. The seed starts to germinate and up the shoot comes and now you've got a tree or a bush or whatever, a fruit tree, etc. But it's got to die first. Now flip over to John chapter 4. The woman at the well. Oh, my, did this speak to me. I had to share this with you. Keep in mind now that a seed has to die. And then it has to be water. And the water gives, and this water in the soil mixture gives it the life it needs to spring forth. You all know the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus is thirsty. He says, hey, go get me some water. And she's caught off guard that a Jew would ask a Samaritan to go get him water. And you know how that story goes. So I'm going to pick it up at verse 10, John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have, have given you living water, living water. Her mind must have been blown. What in the world, in our vernacular, what in the world are you talking about? Living water? What's living water? I mean, <clears throat> is it some special kind of filtered water? Well, what gives? Verse 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? So she's already caught on, right? She's already caught on. She's going... Like I said, what's with the living water? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water, excuse me, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. 
Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. And then you know the rest of the story. Uh, the Lord showed her that basically she didn't have a husband. She had five, and she was not being a very nice girl. Okay? And <clears throat> point. Here's the point. You and I, Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3.16, you must be born again. You have to die to yourself, to your the plan you have for your life, your own self-desires. You have to die to it all. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ through faith. Ask him into your life and into your heart. And that death occurs and then when you place your faith in jesus what happens he sends the holy spirit to you which is the living water the seed your dead spirit your soul your mind they get germinated fed with the living water from god and you're brought back to life spiritually. You're resurrected to new life in Christ. And then one day, should you die and not go to be with the Lord in the rapture, should you die, there'll be the resurrection of your body called the resurrection of the dead. Those who are alive and remain will follow the dead to meet the Lord in the air. That's the resurrection of all saints. And your body and spirit will be joined once again together in a body that God has fashioned for you that will be able to live in both heaven and here on earth. But the key is you have to die to yourself. Bear your cross. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. And then he sprinkles. No, no, he doesn't sprinkle. He pours the Holy Spirit on you. And you come alive. New life in Jesus Christ. What better news could there be? What better news could there be? So this story of the dates and the palm trees that have been you know, lost in Israel, now brought back to Israel. And the archaeologists, or not archaeologists, uh, what are the plant people, those specialists, uh, maybe a botanist, okay? When they took those dead seeds and planted it and watered it and it sprouted, I went, oh my gosh, that's what the Lord talks about in John chapter 4. So your homework assignment, read John chapter 4 today. And be blessed. Let the Lord bless you with, the, with this idea. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to post below this video in the comments the actual video that I saw about this palm tree so that you can be blessed by it too. I'm going to post it when I'm done, okay? Look. Let's wrap this up. I've taken enough of your time, especially on a Saturday. Oh, hey. Okay. Um, thank you for staying with me. Thank you for visiting. It's been fun. Now, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you must be born again. Read John 3.16, Romans chapter 10. Read it and then do it. Uh, God wants you to have everlasting life through his son, Jesus Christ. Go to brosteff.com, B-R-O-S-T-E-F.com, brosteff.com. Go there, scroll down the page in the middle of the page, how to ask Christ into your life. I got some helpful tools for you right there. Okay. And then you can connect with me from that hub, that portal. Uh, but to God bless you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and your entire family today. 
Blessings, blessings, blessings. Have a good Lord's uh, Day tomorrow. Well, unless you're Jewish and the Sabbath is your day, God bless you today. If you're Christian and Sunday's your day, God bless you tomorrow too. So you get a double blessing. Okay, I'll see you again on another Prophecy Insights with Bro Stuff. Thanks again for watching. Oh, share this, comment, and you can also find me on YouTube. Go to brostuff.com. I got everything right there. Bye for now.